All right, I think we can start. Welcome back to everybody and the folks back home. Um, my pen seems to be working today. I didn't do anything to it. It just stopped working last time and now it works again. So I, I brought another one, just a spare, just in case of another disaster. I'm, I'm pretty uh, committed to getting through today without any technical difficulties. So today we are talking uh, some more about functions. I said last time we were gonna do two wild examples of functions. And the first one was um, Dirichlet's function, which looks like this. It has values of zero um, along all the irrationals and values of one along all the rationals. This was Dirichlet's function. And it has very weird properties. Um, it's continuous nowhere. That's the, that's the weird property of this function. Um, it is a weird function, although really, mm, you might say, it's just an aspect of the weirdness of the fact that Q is part of R. Like this, it takes this strange relationship that Q has with everything else, the relationship between the rationals and the irrationals, and kind of clarifies it in a certain way by making a weird function out of it. Um, that was the first of the two wild examples. So another, and in my opinion, considerably wilder example. This is called Tolmay's function. I don't know how you're supposed to pronounce this. I should have looked this up, but I didn't. Tolmay's function. It also has to do with rationals and irrationals, but uh, in this function, and actually in this function also, every irrational gets the value zero. But in this function, the rational numbers get different values depending on what, you know, what they are. And um, specifically, what they are, uh, since they're rational numbers, we're going to write them as fractions. So we write x in q as a fraction, a m over n. Every uh, rational number can be written as a fraction, m over n. And we're going to write it in reduced form because otherwise that's not a unique expression. Uh, you know, every rational number can be made, written in many ways as a fraction, but there's, a, there's only one reduced fraction. Uh, and then the definition of Tomei's function involves the m and the n. Uh, and here it is. So this, I will write it as uh, t of x, t for Ptolemy. Uh, and like I said, it's going to have three cases here. The last case is zero if x is not rational. The first case, this is kind of a technicality. It's one if x is a natural number. Uh, and then here's the interesting part. It's one over n if x is in q, x equals m over n. So the way you do this function is for the rational numbers, you write them as a fraction, and then the answer is 1 over n, whatever that number was. So what is, you know, t of um, 5 eighths is 1 eighth. That's what the definition says. t of uh, 1 third is 1 third. T of two thirds is also one third. You, whatever the fraction is, you just use its denominator and you change the numerator to a one, all right? That's, that's how you get this function. Um, if the number is already a natural number, actually this first, this first case here, is, it kind of follows from the second case. You know, if it's already a natural number, that means when you write the reduced fraction, the denominator is one. So you will get one. Um, and then if it's irrational, you can't write it as a fraction at all. And in that case, you just give it the value zero, all right? So can we try to look at a graph? So much less, much like the uh, Dirichlet function, you can't really draw a, a graph. This thing is so weird, it doesn't really make a nice uh, curve. But we can try, you know. Um, first of all, the, the natural numbers, the, the first case there, the natural numbers, they all get the value one. So, okay, I can do that. One up here, all right, go out to two. 
you know, it's up here, right? Uh, what about, um, of course, there's also the irrational. So I, I'll try to sort of indicate that as like a cloud of points down here whose values are all zero, right? Those are the irrationals. What about the more interesting ones are the one, these ones in the middle, uh, one over n. Whenever the fraction is m over n, the answer is one over n. So what that means is everything which is some kind of halves, one half, uh, not two halves, because that's not reduced, but also three halves, their values are one half, right? That's how the function works. You, you make the numerator one and you keep the denominator what it is. So one half, its value is one half. Three halves, its value is three halves. Actually, would you, would you mind if I, um, uh, I hope you'll agree with me. When I'm drawing these points on the picture, oh, my pen. Maybe I gotta get a new one. All right, I brought my extra one. Let it never be said that I'm unprepared. This is the first time that I've been adequately prepared. Um, yes, it's working. Okay, uh, what I was saying is the points over here, whatever the picture looks like over here, it's actually the same as the picture over here because this function is ignoring the numerators of all of these fractions. So whatever, if you're talking about like five fourths, that's really the same as one fourth if you ignore the, the whole number part of that fraction. So any, uh, any behavior over here is gonna be exactly mirrored by behavior over here. So would you mind if I just, let's just focus on this, this part of it, right? This function actually is periodic, kind of like you know sine and cosine. It just does the same thing uh, over certain intervals. And you really only have to talk about it on, on one little interval from uh, zero to one. So in here, what does it do? Let's see if we can just draw some more points. Is it working here? All right, it's working, it's working. This pen works great, but it's very easy to turn off. So I, I hit the button by accident and it turns off. Okay, what about other values here? Well, we can graph one third, right? Come on, man. Turn the page. One third, the, what's the value of uh, t of one third? It is one third, right? You always just use the same uh, denominator, but uh, you make the numerator one. And then how about two thirds? The value is also one third, right? That's not very symmetric. I, I'm gonna move it over a little in my picture. Two thirds, the value is one third. Okay, how about fourths? I'm just gonna draw sort of increase fractions with increasing denominators. One fourth would be like here. And its answer, its value is one fourth. Um, and also, so two fourths is not reduced. So that one doesn't really count, but three fourths is over here and its value is one fourth, right? Uh, I'll just do the fifths and then maybe we'll get some idea about this. The fifths, actually all the fifths are already uh, fully reduced because five is a prime number. I get two fifths, sorry, one fifth, two fifths, three fifths, and four fifths, and their values are all one fifth, right? You always make the numerator one. So one fifth maybe is here and it has this value. Two fifths is around here, I don't know, has that value, right? Four, uh, three fifths is around here. That's like 0. 0.6, right? Four fifths is up here, something like that, okay? Those are the fifths. Now, my picture's g gonna get, uh, you know, continue to get messier. I'm not gonna try and draw in the six. I actually brought with me a nice picture of Tomei's function. I put it right up here, all right? This is um, a representation of that same graph I was just drawing, where this is zero, and this is one. And this point here is a half, and its value is a half up here. And, and this, on this picture, they didn't even draw in the, the uh, integer values. The whole number, natural number values are like up here, right? Those ones aren't, aren't terribly interesting. This is where the action is though, right? So this point here is the one half. These are the two uh, thirds, one third and two thirds, right? These are the fourths, one fourth and three fourths. And then these are the fifths, which I just drew and, and so on, all right? If you go out and plot those points, this is what it looks like. Pretty crazy. Any questions about how we get that picture? It's, uh, it's a little crazy. Um, what is interesting about this function has to do with where it is and is not continuous. 
Um, you know, today we're going to talk about a real definition of continuous. We haven't really talked about that yet, but um, could we just say sort of informally, would you agree with me if I said right at this point at x equals one half, the um, Tomei's function is not continuous at that point because, why is it? It's because um, all, the, all the nearby x values, their values are all like down here, right? So it's not continuous right there because if I look at nearby x values, their y values are somewhere down here. I suppose of the nearby points, all the irrational ones, there are many irrational nearby points, they are all exactly zero, but even the other rational numbers are all uh, pretty close to zero nearby, right? None of them certainly are, are way up here. So um, this function, I'm gonna go back to where I was writing. Hope you can remember that picture, or this is, this is my poor version of the same picture. Um, T is not continuous at x equal one half for the reasons that I just said. But would you believe me if I said it's also not continuous um, at this point, one third, right? For exactly the same reasons. It's not continuous at this point either. In fact, it's not even continuous, say, right here or even down here, right? These individual points, the function is not continuous at any of them. Uh, in, in fact, it's not continuous at any of the rational numbers, right? Some of these points, like in this area, it looks like those points are really close together and perhaps continuous, but they're not actually continuous. If you zoom in more and more, you would see those points are actually just as you know separated as, as these ones up here, all right? So the moral of the story is this function Tomei's function is not continuous at x equals one half, certainly not, but in fact, it is not continuous at any rational number, x in q, all right? Now, just because I said it that way, this makes the, the, the next question kind of obvious. What about the irrational numbers? I mean, this function seems so crazy that it's just, I mean, it seems like maybe it's just not continuous at all. But I'm here to tell you, T is continuous at every irrational, at every X which is not in Q. This is the crazy thing about uh, Ptolemy's function. It actually is continuous at every irrational. Check it out. Um, Let's talk about everybody's favorite irrational. Let's, um, let's say x is the square root of two, all right? One point something something. I actually wrote these down. But anyway, um, what is the value of t is the name of this function? Then t of x is, what is it? Right, give me a hand signal. Zero, yes. Sorry, I wasn't sure. Oh, I just turned it off then t of x is zero because that's the definition. If it's irrational, if the x is irrational, then you get zero for the answer. Okay, what would it mean for it to be continuous? Uh, continuous, uh, in this case, means that if x is near root two, then t of x is near zero, right? That's what, that's what, uh, I hope that's what you feel like continuous means. It means if you change the x value by a little bit, then the y value will change by a similar little bit. It won't just j jump to be something completely different, right? So to explain why it's continuous, it means if x is near root two, and I don't mean other irrational, certainly if x is another irrational near root two, then it's going to be zero again. But if, even if it's irrational, even if it's rational near root two, then a t of x is near zero. Well, let's try and think about it. What does a rational number, what does a rational number look like if it's really close to root two? So that's what I'm trying to think about. What, what, are, what are the uh, rationals really nearby? What are their values gonna be when I do this function? Well, um, 
in my calculator, I did this, I plugged this into my calculator. The digits of root two are, anybody know? No, certainly not. 1.4142135, etc. Okay, these are the digits. So uh, this, when you see, when you look at these digits, it gives you a clue of how do you like think of a rational number that's really close to root two. Well, a rational number close to root two would be if I just chop off some of those digits. So a rational number close to root two is 1.4142135. How about that, right? That's a rational because I, I actually stopped there. I don't, I don't put the dot, dot, dot. This is rational and it's pretty close to root two. Uh, and what is T of that? 1.4142135. I want to know, is, is the t value also close to zero? That would indicate that it is continuous because root two, the value is equal to zero. Here's a nearby rational. I would like to know, is the value close to zero? Uh, well, what is that? Remember the definition of t? You have to write this in a reduced form. So this, um, I don't know about the reduced form, but it's easy enough to write it as some fraction. It is 141. 42135 divided by 1000000, right? That's what that decimal thing means. You can write it as a fraction like that. I think I got the right number of zeros there. Now this, um, I uh, reduced the fraction um, just looking at common factors. I think you can factor out a five from those, but nothing else. So when you reduce the fraction, this is what you get. 288427 over 200,000 or 2 million. I'm not sure if I got the numbers. I think the first denominator there should be 10 million and this should be 2 million. I, I, it doesn't really matter. But. Anyway, what is the value of t then? t of that fraction. So this fraction is in reduced form. I checked it on my computer. Uh, so what would the answer of t of that be? Yeah. One over, One over whatever that denominator is. Two million is what I said it was. All right. And what do you know? That number is, in fact, close to zero, right? It really is. This is approximately zero, all right? And this was not some kind of coincidence. If you take numbers, you know, I took a number close to root two by, by using this many decimal digits, right? What if you used more decimal digits? This would just be even closer to zero, wouldn't it? Um, as this number that I took, this rational, as it gets closer and closer to root two, the answer here will, will use increasingly large denominators. And then this answer will be closer and closer to zero. So uh, that means so T is continuous at X equals root two. Very weird in my opinion, because the graph looks so crazy. It doesn't look like it should be continuous anywhere, but it is continuous at X equal root two. And there's nothing special about root two here. So T is continuous at every X, which is not rational. And it is discontinuous at every rational. This is the, uh, the wonderful thing about Tomei's function. Any thoughts about that? Any questions about that one? So this is an, yet another example trying to um, just uh, communicate the fact that functions can be pretty crazy. Uh, functions from R to R. Everybody's got their own favorite functions. This is in my top 10, I would say, it, easily the top 10. I, I don't know if I, I've never tried to actually write down my top 10 functions. Uh, I like this one a lot though. All right, Any questions about that? Okay, great. Let's talk then, I think we're ready to talk about the definition of the limit of a function.
we have talked at length about limits of um, sequences, but Uh, let's talk about limits of a function. The concept uh, that we're going to use for the definition is similar to the sequences limit definition, which involved the epsilon and the big N, right? Uh, and it's been a little while since we did that. Uh, but, um, so I'll just say we wish to define what it means to say lim x goes to, now the, the uh, notation that they usually use here is x approaching c of f of x equals some answer L. Is that a tour walking by? I always like when the tour walks by when I'm talking about some giant random numbers because they, they will look and say, oh yeah, that's a math class. But I feel like most of the time, if like high school students walk by, they would not be able to identify what I'm talking about at all. If they see some nonsense numbers, they're like, oh yeah, that guy gets it. Hmm? Are they still doing words? Here? I think you can like it's it's like one, uh, just like one family at a time. I think. Yeah, they're like yeah. private tours. I've seen it, yeah. Private tours. Cool yeah, I guess. Better than being in a group of twenty people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that is better. Okay. So uh, anyway, we wish to define this. I'll tell you right now, the tours would not like what this definition looks like. Um, it doesn't look like uh, big numbers or anything. We want to define this. Remember, this is what they told you in your youth, you know, when x is really, really close to c, then f of x is really, really close to l. That's the idea, but we want a real definition for that. The picture that you should have in mind is something like this. I have some, some particular value c that the x is getting close to, and you know, some function like this. And then the value of the function is uh, this l, and I'm trying to say that if x is close to c, then the y values um, will be close to l. That's what it means to be continuous. Let me just refresh our memory about the definition of the limit of a sequence. When we say limit of a n equals l, this means the way we write this is for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists n, a natural number, such that, n greater than or equal to n, what? No, not the natural numbers. That one implies distance from a n to l less than epsilon. All right. We are going to have a similar definition to this. So your interpretation of these two parts, this one right here means, you know, a n is really close to l. And this part over here means n is really big. Even though the definition doesn't actually say that this big N is a really big number or that the epsilon is a really small number, um, those, those are sort of built into the fact that I'm using this for all epsilon and there exists N. All right. We would like to translate that. So what we want, we want it to say something like if X is really close to C, then um, f of x is really close. All right, my handwriting is deteriorating. Really close to l, all right? So actually, the 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 thing after the then this stuff it looks a lot like this stuff right here, and we can more or less write it in the same way. The thing after the then here looks just like this, and we're gonna write it in the same way. What about the beginning, the first part here? In the case of sequences uh, and functions, the, the first part is gonna be pretty different. This uh, said n is really big. In the case of functions, this part is another really close. So actually, what we're gonna see in the case of functions is there will also be this kind of if-then structure but the two things on either side, they will look similar. One of them will say um, x is close to c, and the other one will say f of x is close to l, right? So maybe we could say, how do we write the uh, second part? Anybody maybe think you can tell me what, what we should say 
I mean, up here, this is how you say AN is really close to L. So how would I say, what should I say down here? For functions, I want to say F of X is really close to L. X minus L less than X. Yeah, we're just going to say absolute value, F of X minus L less than epsilon. So there will be an epsilon here. Um, what about on the other side, before the implication sign there? is also going to be another really close thing. Um, it's going to look like this again. Now, over here, I'm not going to use a big N because I want another quantity which is going to be um, very small. And there's another name for it. We use, always we're going to use a lowercase delta, which kind of goes along with the lowercase epsilon that's used on the right side. And then what am I going to put inside the absolute values over there on the left side? I want it to indicate that X is close to C. I heard some mutterings. X minus C, I think, is what we want, right? So now it says if X is really close to C, then F of X is really close to L. That's that part. All right, so this is a little messy. Let me just write the real definition all at once here. So the definition, we say that F of X, sorry, lim, x goes to c, f of x equals l. We say this when, all right, and it begins with, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists, but this time it's delta greater than zero. So in this, uh, in this, oh, I just pulled the plug on my Zoom. Sorry, folks back home. To restart my share. It's working. I started screen sharing. Not yet finished, apparently. again. Unplug it. Replug it. Got to be careful not to pull the wire. Okay, I think we're back. Okay, so instead of the epsilon and the big N, we have two small quantities, epsilon and delta. And as usual, it's not necessary to say that they are small quantities um, as part of the definition because the definition is only interesting when they're small. So for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists delta greater than zero such that X minus C less than delta implies F of X minus L less than epsilon. All right, now there's one technicality in the definition which I left out and I'm about to write it in. It is right here. So I just added this, zero less than X minus C. I hope you left enough space to squeeze that in. That, this is a technicality, but it is important. The reason it's important, I'll tell you, is remember the picture that this is supposed to represent? Here's my C. Here's my L, L is the Y value, all right? Um, what the picture means in terms of the epsilons and the deltas, it means if X is close to C, like within delta of C, one way you could write, indicate that is like, here's C plus delta and here's C minus delta, and X is somewhere inside that little um, interval, that little neighborhood, if you will. And that will force the value of uh, the Y value to be inside some other neighborhood over here. I'll say this is L plus epsilon. This is L minus epsilon. It means that there's sort of like a little, a little, these deltas and epsilons are describing kind of a little box around this point where as long as the X is in the appropriate, um, appropriately close to the C, then the Y value will come out appropriately close to the L. All right. Something that you, you learned when you're in calculus, though, is the definition of a limit 
is only about values which are approaching C nearby. It is not actually about the value C itself. Like, uh, for example, in a, in a uh, discontinuous function, or a, you've seen lots of examples in a calculus class, sort of like this. Remember that kind of thing, which has a, a hole and the uh, individual point is filled in, but in like a weird place, not, not along the curve. In this case, the limit as, so if this is say one, this is uh, maybe one, two, three. Remember in such an example, the limit as x approaches one of this function is, what is it? The limit, two. it is two, yeah. When you ask about the limit, you should be looking along the curve. Where does the curve go to? And it is two. Even though the value right at one is all the way up at three, all right? The moral of the story is when you are considering the limit, you should not be considering when the x value actually equals this point down here. You should only consider when it's nearby that point. And that's why we need this right there, right? This makes it so that um, we are not considering when x actually equals c but only when x is close to c, all right? That's the importance of that. Um, it turns out when you're doing like examples of, of demonstrating that this or that limit exists or something, that, that greater than zero is, is, is usually not necessary, but um, it is technically part of the definition. All right, this is the definition of the limit of a function. This is colloquially referred to as the epsilon delta definition. And it is the big sort of, uh, I would say it is sort of a, a big deal in real analysis. You know, when you talk to your friends, tell them you take a real analysis class, they'll say, oh man, how do you like that epsilon delta definition? That's like the big thing that everybody remembers. At least you remember that it is a thing. I mean, I'm not saying everybody remembers what the definition is per se, but um, it's a big concept. And this is really, you know, as far as the, um, in my opinion, this thing that I just put in the red box is really one of the great achievements of mathematics in terms of taking an idea which seems pretty intuitive uh, and making a real definition out of it. The real definition, I would say, is not intuitive at all. You have to, you have to be thinking in a very particular way to make this definition. Um, but it is the simplest real definition. Of, there's not an easier way to make this definition. Uh, let me just say one way we can also write this in a slightly different way. We can write it in terms of neighborhoods. I'll say this and then we're just going to do some examples. Neighborhoods. Um, we could say it this way, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists delta greater than zero such that um, X is in V delta of C implies F of X is in V epsilon of L. Check it out. It's the same thing, really. Uh, if you look at this picture, I think you'll agree they're the same. When I said the distance from X to C is less than delta, that's the same thing as saying V is in the neighborhood around C with radius delta, all right? And then the other part says that the distance from F of X to L is less than epsilon. That's the same as saying that F, uh, X is within distance L of epsilon means X is inside the neighborhood around L with radius epsilon, right? Okay, uh, this, this is um, an interesting way to write it, although, uh, to be honest, we're not going to use that formulation of the definition very often. The, um, the thing that I said in red before is really where it's at in terms of, uh, if I ask you to show that the limit of something is something or other, use the thing in the red box. All right? Any questions about that before we get to some examples? All right, let's try some examples. Uh, so, when you... Um, when it comes to demonstrating that this or that limit exists, the, you're going to have to do a little proof involving epsilons and deltas, but it goes very much like those old proofs for showing that a sequence um, has a limit. The very same uh, kind of structure to the proof that you're going to use. Let's do an easy one. This is an easy one. 
What do you say? Limit as x goes to 4 of 2x, what do you think it is? 8. 8, yes. A master of calculus in our presence here. Yeah. Uh, it is 8. Um, uh, just like limits of a sequence, you pretty much have to know the answer before you go through and, and prove the, uh, that the limit is actually equal to whatever uh, it is. Anyway, here I'm going to prove it. So we're going to use the same sort of three, three steps that I, that I indicated for the um, proofs with the epsilons and the big Ns. We begin by saying, let epsilon greater than zero be given. And then I'm going to say we will find... Now, it's not big N anymore, but it's delta. We will find delta greater than zero such that zero less than X minus C. Now, it's not C, it's four, right? Remember in the, uh, in the setup of the definition, the number sort of downstairs that the X is approaching is C, which is four in this case, less than delta implies. And then over here, F of X minus L. What is that gonna look like in this example? 2x minus 8, right, less than epsilon, right? This in the definition is f of x minus l, that's this part. In our case, f of x is 2x, and l, the, the limit, is 8, all right? Now, we're going to do a bunch of sort of work on the side, just like when we did with our sequences. Remember, when you do the, sequ the sequences thing, you basically begin with this, so you start with 2x minus 8, I'm going to say. You try to simplify that. And eventually sort of solve for... Now, when we did this for sequences, remember? You had, it was like this, right? n greater than the n implies something or other less than epsilon, right? You start with the something or other, and then you solved it for n, you wanted it to say n greater than something, 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 right? That was the strategy that you used when it was sequences. This time around is a little harder because instead of solving for n, you want to solve for, like n was over here, right? Huh? n was right there being greater than something. That's why you wanted to solve for n greater than something, right? Over here, we need x minus 4 less than delta. What we have to do in this case is sort of solve for absolute value x minus 4, which is considerably weirder. And really, you want it to say x minus 4, uh, absolute value x minus 4 less than something, something, right? Don't worry, it'll be fine. So we start with this 2x minus 8. Can you somehow solve for x minus 4? Uh, you're not really solving for it, but you have to do some kind of thing to make that look like x minus 4. What can you do? Can you just divide by 2? Yeah, you can factor a 2 out of that. And uh, in fact, you can factor it all the way out of the absolute value, right? This is the same as 2 absolute value x minus 4. We got lucky, right? The thing already pretty much looked like x minus 4. In a more complicated example, you might have to do something much more complicated here to make to make the thing pop out that you want, all right? But anyway, this is 2x minus 4. And now, so um, can I just say I want 2 times absolute value x minus 4 less than epsilon. I'm going to solve this now, i.e. absolute value x minus 4 less than epsilon over 2, all right? And then this is what I choose to be my delta. If you look back at those sequence proofs, it's very much the same kind of thing. You solve for that n, you usually get some weird formula in terms of the big N, and then that's what, or in terms of epsilon, you know, 1 over the square root of epsilon or something, and that's what you choose the big N to be. In this kind of a problem, this is what you choose the delta to be. And if you did it right, uh, one sort of sanity check is epsilon is supposed to be a small number. Epsilon over 2 is also supposed to be a small number, right? As opposed to, when you do sequences, you end up, at, um, you know, the typical thing that you end up with in a sequence would be something like n equals 1 over root epsilon or something. And in this case, epsilon being a small number makes this a very big number, which is, 
if that happens in a sequence proof, it means you probably did it right. It's the opposite in, the, in this uh, functions proof. The thing you end up here, if, if epsilon is really small, the thing you end up in this position should also be really small. It's just epsilon over two. Anyway, my real, so this was all sort of a sidebar. My real proof continues. I'm gonna say let delta equal epsilon over two, right? Then, at this point in a sequence proof, I would say something like, then let little n be greater than big N, and then we have blah, 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 blah. So this time I'm gonna say, then let zero less than x minus four less than delta. And we have, and I begin with two x minus eight, and I have to show that that is less than epsilon. What do I do with that? I do the same things that we did in the simplifications, which is factor out the two. This says two absolute value x minus four. But then because I just said, let absolute value x minus four be less than delta, right? So this is less than two, oops, not black. Less than two, sorry, that's, right? The x minus four is less than delta. But then what do I do with two delta? A delta equals epsilon over two, so this is two times epsilon over two, which equals epsilon as desired, right? Two x minus eight less than epsilon. And that's the end, right? Any questions about that? This is how we do it. All right, I got one for you guys to try and the folks back home too. Let's try. Find lim x goes to five of two x plus three and prove it. The find part is easy. That's just decide what you think the limit actually is and then See if you can demonstrate it using the epsilon and delta. Whoa. My computer just turned off. Why me? Unbelievable. <laughs> I was maintaining my distance from it, but it turned off anyway. That's right, we're almost done. Just doing one last exam.
crazy. Screen share from the, the Vano 139 computer. I don't know why you became the leader, but I have faith in you. is dead. I'm gonna put my screen on this on this guy. I almost made it through the class. You made it pretty far though. Yeah. Technical issues. I mean, since the beginning of the year, you only started having some of the classes. My physics professor has had an issue every class. Oh yeah. Started. Yeah. All right. Okay, let's do this. Um, Okay, I'm feeling good now. Uh, first of all, what's the limit? Thirteen. Yes. Thank you. All right. So this is thirteen. All right, and prove it. Okay, I gotta say, let us zero be given. We'll find delta greater than zero such that. All right, zero less than. Okay. Um, what should I say here? X minus five less than delta implies, and over here, it's gonna be F of X minus L. That would be two X minus three minus 13. Maybe two X plus three. Plus three, thank you. Yes, and you will notice there's some kind of magic that happens, just like by some sort of magic, you can actually factor out and get X minus five. Um, and if you messed it up, for instance, by writing two X minus three, it just won't work, uh, or if you, chose the wrong value for this limit for some reason, if you thought the limit was gonna be 18, you get stuck down here, it won't factor properly. Uh, it's, it, it's always, to me, it's kind of satisfying to see how this works. So on the side, although there's not much to it, I'm gonna simplify here. This of course is 2x minus 10, which factors 5x minus, no, 2x minus 5. All right, and then I say I want two times x minus five to be less than epsilon, and we divide by two. Absolute value x minus five less than epsilon over two, and that's the uh, that's my delta. All right. I hope that's I, as I was walking around, it seemed like everybody was was saying that. So I say let delta equal epsilon over two. Then now both examples we've done so far have been epsilon over two. It's not always epsilon over two. Um, it's because basically both of these functions have a, have a two right there, two times x, uh, which is what made that happen. Anyway, uh, then let zero less than x minus five less than 
Delta. And we have, I begin with uh, 2x plus 3 minus 13. This equals, same simplifications as before, 2 absolute value x minus 5. But that is less than 2 delta. And delta is epsilon over 2. So this is epsilon. So 2x plus 3 minus 13 less than epsilon as desired. That's it. All right. Sorry, I went over by a minute. Okay, we'll do a lot more interesting examples uh, next time. Have a great weekend.